This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible by products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. There are several independent mechanisms of ageing which are roughly synchronised. In other words, we have several assassins and they are independent contractors. And if we neutralize one, another will kill us within the approximately the same time frame. Hello and welcome again to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. My name is Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Or put another way, how long are we going to live and what quality of life will we enjoy during our remaining years? Now, over the past hundred or so episodes of this podcast, we've discussed many lifestyle interventions that could result in us living longer, healthier lives. I often talk about extending health span, the number of years we enjoy optimum health. Others talk about life extension or extreme lifespan, 100, maybe 120 years, which, of course, the vast majority of us really still have very little chance of achieving. So are the interventions really worth it? How much extra quality time might they give us? My guest today is Dr. Magomed Kaidikov, a medical doctor and researcher based at the moment in Little Rock, Arkansas, here in the United States, originally from Russia. He's a Canadian citizen and he has an interesting perspective, having spent a lifetime studying human longevity and ageing. The title of his book is A Pessimistic Guide to Anti-Aging Research, subtitle Death is Immortal. Dr. Kaedikov, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Hi. Do you, I'm curious, yourself aspire to live a long time? It depends. It depends on quality of life, whether it's interesting and uh, disease-free. You uh, work at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I had a quick look at your page on the website, and you talk about your interest in the biology of aging and degenerative pathologies, in particular, you say, in identification and correction of biological design flaws that limit mammalian lifespan. That's what you've spent a long time working on. So what makes you pessimistic? Oh, uh, pessimism, it's not really a pessimism. Uh, I would rather qualify it as a, a realistic view because what we need to find is working solutions. But gerontological research is always accompanied, accompanied um, with an um, enormous amount of hype and self-promotion. People are so focused on becoming successful in this research that um, they tend to overlook half-honestly negative components or negative conclusions stemming from this research. Well, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned about lifestyle and uh, its potential to increase our lifespan. Let me give you a small example. So two pillars of healthy uh, lifestyle is diet, of course, and exercise. So in animal studies, Uh, researchers were able to achieve 50% increase in lifespan across many species. Interesting. Very hopeful. But at the same time, they failed to mention, um, whether intentionally or not, I don't care, that uh, there are three groups of animals, including us, our pets, and uh, lab animals, that know the phenomenon of obesity. And all experiments were conducted on obese animals because they were fed ad libitum. They ate as much as they want. So when you restrict the diet and caloric intake, you're essentially rescuing obese animals. So that extension of lifespan is inflated or can be related only to obese organisms. 
I want to delve into that in a little bit more detail in a second because I think it is a fascinating theory. I've got a, a flaw potentially in, in my mind that I want to put to you. Just before we do that, though, I, I mentioned that you're originally from Russia. You're a Canadian citizen. You're in Arkansas now. Can you just give me a little potted history of uh, your lifetime in terms of research and what got you interested in aging and longevity to start with? Always, for everybody, is a personal story. I do remember when I was about 30 or something like that. I was half asleep, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, a little string of words entered my brain, which was empty at the time. And uh, it uh, read something that in 30, 40 years you will die. Being half asleep, uh, I didn't comprehend it completely, but then my body comprehended it, and my entire body contracted violently. I don't know why. Aging interests me as a phenomenon, and of course as a personal affair. It's everybody's personal affair. As far as my career goes, um, I graduated from first medical institute in Moscow and uh, immediately went into research. And my first PhD was in space biology and medicine. I was studying uh, calcium metabolism in microgravity at one point, and then I moved to Canada, and I did analysis of genotoxicity of space environment, trying to determine whether space environment generates more mutations. But aging was always of tremendous interest to me. That's why I entered another PhD program, at this time on molecular biology. And after that, I joined the uh, lab of very well-known, internationally recognized expert on uh, aging, Robert Schmuckler-Rees, and he happened to work at the, at the University of, uh, of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. So that's yeah. how it came about. So you have a, a wealth of experience. So let me now return to that thought when you were talking about extending the lifespan of obese animals. And yes. uh, most experiments uh, to this day are still done with, with rats and, and mice and, yes. and, and flies and worms. But you, you, I guess you're probably talking about experiments with, with mice. On any experimental animal, because all animals are fed ad libitum. I don't know what obesity looks like uh, in C. elegans, but they're also overfed. But I would perhaps suggest to you that uh, there, there is research where those animals are not obese to start with. That There, there is a, a scientific credibility that goes along with much of the research that uh, in terms of control groups, uh, not yes, all the yes, animals are starting from an obese state. If you use non-obese animals, uh, your numbers will plummet significantly. And let's go to the epidemiological studies on human beings, which involved around one million people. And it turns out that um, the highest life expectancy is within 22, 25 BMI values. And everything below that and everything higher than that is accompanied with increased, uh, decreased life expectancy. So the sweet spot is not where extremely thin people are. And it's also not where slightly over, overweight people are. I'm, for example, about 23, 24. So I'm comfortably sitting in a sweet spot, which means that decrease of caloric intake will not benefit me that much. So decrease of caloric intake will benefit human being proportionally to his BMI index, inversely proportionally to his BMI index. But there is some evidence, isn't there, and I think you've alluded to it, that uh, caloric restriction of all of the interventions is probably the most effective in terms of giving, whether it's rats and mice or human beings, some extra years. True. But the number of these years is not that terribly significant. And uh, it amounts to no more than 10 years with uh, diet and exercise combined. Yes, it's a big benefit, relatively, but it stays within design limits of the structure that we call our bodies. And benefit from that perspective, not that big. 
So let me make the distinction, which I did in the introduction, and I often do, between lifespan and health span. Now, we've, we've talked, we're referring in the conversation so far to lifespan, the number of years we actually, or mice and rats or flies or worms, actually live. I think the focus, certainly my focus, is on health span, the number of healthy years that we have when we can live active lives, uh, involved lives, do things, enjoy life, enjoy each other. And the, a lot of the interventions that we talk about, including caloric restriction, can extend those, those healthy years as opposed to perhaps the vast majority of the, the human population who will end up with those final years not being particularly healthy and not particularly enjoyable. I agree with you. So I would... Um double the number of years. So uh, healthy lifestyle, including um, diet and exercise, would increase your health span, presumably, by two decades. How does that sound? Well, two decades sounds pretty good to me. I'm happy for you, then. <laughs> not, not to you? No, because uh, I do have a different purpose. At least, I don't find it extremely interesting, because we are simply scraping for additional months and few years using behavior modification technique. I'm interested in uh, breaking the ceiling, in correcting design flaws you referred to. And there are many, because uh, uh, longevity is a foster child of science. Uh, not science, nature. It never was a, a priority for nature. So it's a sort of a byproduct. So the mechanisms that are driving our aging are based on those little engineering design flaws that are still lingering in our bodies, to some degree. And there are many of those. I can identify at least three design flaws, which, if they are corrected, maybe will give us a chance to very significantly extend our lifespan move our ceiling much, much, much higher, regardless of our um, behavioral patterns. Do you want to tell us what those three design flaws are? Well, before I go into this, uh, we need to address the current state of gerontology or address our understanding of the aging process. And my understanding of the aging process is that there are several independent mechanisms of aging which are roughly synchronized. In other words, we have several assassins, and they are independent contractors. And if we neutralize one, another will kill us within the approximately the same time frame. And let's say we're addressing telomeres as a panacea from aging. It's not going to work. There are other assassins in line. Uh, let's say we address mutations in uh, nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Still, it's not enough because there is an epigenetic factor that will kill us nonetheless. So essentially our strategy should be such, if we seriously intend to get any kind of practical output from our gerontological efforts, we need simultaneously address all the major killers. I'm not talking about diseases, I'm talking about mechanisms. So as far as design flaws are concerned. Uh, one of them first is mitochondrial DNA. From engineering perspective, it's ridiculous to leave genetic material in a harmful environment. And as long it's there, or uh, as long it's not modified somehow uh, to prevent accumulation of mutations because they accumulate in mitochondrial DNA 10 times faster than in nuclear DNA, uh, we cannot solve the problem of relatively rapid deterioration of our brain and our skeletal muscles because these are non-dividing, non-renewable tissues. Then again, one of the flaws is accumulation of mutations in DNA. But even if, uh, if we solve it, well, right now it's kind of irrelevant to aging because we have several assassins. So the uh, question of mutations should be addressed in conjunction with, for example, telomeres. Because can you imagine we solve the problem of mutations, and yet telomeres will kill us at specified time? So accumulation of mutations at present level become a liability and design flaw if simultaneously we solve the problem of telomeres, and vice versa. 
Same goes to epigenetics and mutations, epigenetics and telomeres. All kinds of relationships are linked to each other. So if we solve the problem of mutations, telomeres become my liability and design flaw. So that's uh, my very rough understanding of this process. Yeah, that's interesting. So mitochondrial science, telomere science, all important. And we've talked about and we've emphasized um, lifespan, how long we are going to live. But what about the, let's say, the societal benefits of simply being healthy or healthier as we grow older? And much of this research, I'm sure much of your research and some of the issues that you pinpoint, if we were better able to to get through life, if some of those flaws were worked on and we could find solutions that we were healthier at 40, 50, 60, 70, uh, we would all benefit. That surely is worth it. Surely, but it's a very minimalistic approach. It's a very practical, prudent, um, almost scroogey kind of approach. Let's, uh, let's keep a small bird which is in our hands instead of chasing the one that is flying so very high. But what's scroogey about aspiring for better health as we grow older? No, I do not disagree, God forbid. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that it's not interesting to me because that problem is already solved. There are solutions to this problem. So it's your personal decision whether you have healthy lifespan and you can uh, be assured uh, barring um, accidents like cancer or something like that, that he will extract from your behavior additional 10 years. But it's not a scientific problem. It's a social problem. It's a problem of self-discipline. It's a problem of promotion of a, a healthy lifestyle. But it's not a scientific problem. I don't care for it, being myself. You're saying science has, has no role in the everyday health no, of society? No, 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 no. Of society? course, when uh, um, some dignified-looking... Uh, very respected gerontologist will come and address big crowds saying, people, please behave, eat less and exercise. Maybe it will help to some degree, but it's not a scientific problem. It's not an academic problem. It's not a research problem because we know the answers already. Do you live your life in a certain way so as to maintain good health or do you not think about it? Well, it turns out that I have uh, good genetics. Uh, I never refrained from anything, and no, I don't have self-discipline. And uh, if we were in a confession booth, I would say, uh, Father, I have sinned, and I'm still smoking, and all these kind of things. So, no, I do not follow advice of the wise. As a longevity researcher, you, you, you are still smoking? Life is full of par paradoxes. I'm living a certain lifestyle without choosing. Um, I simply do not understand the calculating approach to um, your lifestyle. It just happens. Because I, I lived in Russia where everybody smoked and everybody had a certain lifestyle. I developed so, certain slightly ossified habits. And so far, they didn't harm me greatly. So I have no subconscious reason to really desire to get rid of them. So what is your view of the, uh, let's call it the, the business of longevity, the industry around longevity that we see today, the, the myriad diets, the keto diets, the uh, fasting or the fasting mimicking diets that I've talked a lot about, the, the different uh, exercise regimes that, uh, and especially at this time of the year, the beginning of the year, that people are pounded with information and make a short-term change in their lifestyle and then perhaps go back to how they were a few months ago. What do you think about the business that surrounds all of that? I think it's disgusting. I don't like it because it's, it's driven by um, greed, essentially. Because um, recipes of healthy life has been around, validated for about 2,000 years. From Cicero and Galen to um, Luigi Cornaro to later day uh, people who proved by their own lives that simple moderation is sufficient to extend your lifespan dramatically. So essentially don't voluntarily put the gun to your scalp. And that's about it. There is nothing truly... Ah, the problem... The problem with the American public 
that they live by the principle you are worth it. Uh, they absolutely resist any kind of effort. So essentially they want to uh, get some sort of pill and without any inconvenience uh, lose extra pounds without exercising will, without forcing themselves. So it's purely psychological phenomenon that is exploited by those who create all those regimes, uh, regiments, uh, supplements, and so on and so forth. I mentioned uh, some people talk about extreme lifespan, maybe 90, 100, 120 years even, which uh, are extremely rare examples uh, throughout the centuries of people achieving that sort of great age. I think the most, of, most of us can still expect to live to our late 70s, around about 80 years old. From your understanding of, of that data, how likely is that average lifespan, do you think, to change in the coming decades? I think we almost reached the limit for average person. 122 years uh, the maximum lifespan ever achieved by human beings is an anomaly. It indicates the most extreme limit for human lifespan, considering our current organization, um, the ability of our organism to last. So that's why I'm concerned, interested in finding and correcting design flaws. No matter what you do, though, you and I most likely will die around 80, 85, depending on the country. And depending on the country being the quality of health care that we get in those later years. Yeah, because here in the United States, it's extremely expensive. It's so expensive, in fact, that uh, it leaves everybody else in the dust. Although many of those everybody else have better health care and higher life expectancy. And not by small number, by five to six years. And do you think some of us who think a lot about aging and, and longevity would actually have a better quality of life as we grow older if we didn't spend as much time pondering and thinking and aspiring to, to reach a great age. <laughs> well, that group of people are um, can be qualified as slightly paranoid personality. Not everybody is like that. So I would prefer people to enjoy life without always thinking about death. You would agree that uh, it's counterproductive. And maybe I'll suggest that a lot of people with that frame of mind are listening to this podcast. <laughs> no, I just find it ridiculous because uh, uh, in the field of gerontology, especially with a very large pool of groupies who are half informed and uh, half educated, many of those people have obsessive personalities. And uh, they can be manipulated, but it's not healthy, it's not productive, really. So I do not understand all this. Normally, I do not think about death. How do you... You don't normally think about death. When you do think about death, is it something that scares you? Is it something that you look forward to or you are neutral about, just knowing that it, it will happen? That's a very complicated question because uh, it has a range from practical to highly philosophical. So it's too open to answer. I do not think about death, but my attitude to death has changed over, year, over the years. I do not have a trepidation of the young organism against sudden discontinuity. And that you learn to accept that it will more or less inevitably happen. So my only hope and expectation that I will uh, face it calmly, like Julius Caesar, for example with certain dignity. So you've spent a, a lifetime studying this area, aging, longevity, yes. and in, in terms of longevity, based on the scientific knowledge that you've acquired over the years, your views must have changed quite considerably over those decades. Sure. But let's start from the beginning. Okay. We all have similar lifespan, but one century ago, our ancestors lived about 44 years on average. Do you feel any sense of gratitude? Do you feel any difference? No, you don't. I'm answering for you. Because for mm. you, it's a given. You just take it. But your attitude to your lifespan in terms of its duration is uh, very passionate. You consider it's very low. Um, intolerably low, as a matter of fact. Now, if your lifespan, if the lifespan of the entire humanity 
would change to 200 years. Will anything change psychologically? It will be all the same. You will take it as a given and still consider this 200-year limit unacceptable. Always aspiring for more. Yes, because it belongs to everybody. It may sound offensive to you, but in order to appreciate extremely long lifespan, it should belong to a minor part of mankind. You should have neighbors that live twice half as long as you in order to appreciate your years. You need some sort of reference point that you truly live so much longer than the people around you. So psychologically, extreme longevity can be appreciated if it belongs to few people. Otherwise, 500,000 years, what does it matter? Psychologically, it will be all be the same. It's still not an eternity. You write in the book, towards the end of the book, that you are entering into the twilight of your life. True. Now, how old are you now, do you mind me asking? Beatles. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64. Beautiful age. <laughs> but hardly the twilight. Well, uh, in uh, a second sonnet of Shakespeare, I think, uh, the first sentence was that when something like twilight, judging from this sentence, started at 40. I, I don't remember exact wording, but the impression was that 40 is where the actual decline of your life begins. Now it's probably 70. I don't know. But it depends, because uh, uh, up until I was 60, I didn't feel any difference whatsoever. And I looked like looked 30, and I reaped all the benefits of looking 30 being 60. But then uh, some sort of slight, almost imperceptible change happened, happened, and uh, I realized that I'm entering a different phase of my life. And you also suggest in your book, in concluding your thoughts, that if you were to have your time again, that you may not have followed the same course of research and you, you question whether you would engage in something less inherently useless than, you say, giving in to the terror of, of dying. If you had your time again, would you do something different? My life is driven by accidents. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that my new life... Uh, would be doing by accidents too. And I would be in a different place. What kind of place would you like to be in, though? I, I, that's what I'm, what I'm getting at. I have no idea. Uh, I enjoy many things. And uh, I, I'm not entirely disappointed with uh, the way my life went because uh, it was really pleasurable. I had many friends. No, it was really pleasurable. I, I do have things to remember. And... Um, Many other people don't, or they have to remember suffering, mostly. So I'm very fortunate. I'm one, I'm one of the few who has no complaints whatsoever. So I'm wondering what your thoughts, or maybe even your advice, would be to young students of longevity today, young aging researchers getting into this field. There are many, many university degrees focused on longevity these days, different aspects of science. What would you say to those people? Well, first of all, bio, uh, importance of biology declined over the years, actually declined dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, from now on, biology will play a second fiddle to uh, big data science and silica science just for confirmation of ideas uh, produced by artificial intelligence or whatever it is. So the answers to aging lie probably not entirely in biology now. And maybe even with the methods biology has, it cannot provide any answers. I'm not sure about that. Because we need far more complex vision of the aging process that any individual with a biological degree can master. Uh, we need to see it as a extremely complex phenomenon and that uh, attention or obsession with a single mechanism, single molecule, single intervention 
will get us uh, will get us nowhere. I'm very interested in phenomenon of aging. I will continue working on it, and I will be doing experiments if and when I can. And uh, in this context, uh, I have a fundraiser right now on Facebook for some uh, experiments aimed to de- uh, aimed to delay aging specific dementias and it's related to mitochondria so i'm raising the money and as soon as i raise sufficient amount i will conduct some experiments either in russia or in latin america because uh, in the united states it's extremely expensive and uh, that's it thank you for talking to us it's been interesting and in your book you explore all of this in considerable detail that we haven't had clearly time in, in the podcast to do and i have it right here a pessimistic guide to anti aging research death is immortal I'd, i recommend it to anyone anyone listening to this podcast who may think on the surface that they actually disagree with you there's there's a lot of stuff in there that i think will resonate with a lot of people and uh, i'm really grateful to you for talking to us about it okay nice talking to you thank you so much and if this interview hasn't <laughs> maybe put you off the subject completely please visit our website lamapodcast.com double l a m a podcast.com you'll find there an index of all of our interviews to date and you can have a listen and make up your own mind you can also listen rate and review us at apple podcasts or your podcasting platform of choice wherever you find us stay healthy and thanks for listening